It's the Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Colleges and universities, including those here in Northeast Ohio, are struggling financially. While each situation is different and unique, a common thread is that there are fewer college-age students It is part of a trend that it's referred to as an enrollment or demographic cliff, and it's impacting the bottom lines of higher education institutions. Earlier this month, Notre Dame College in South Euclid closed its doors after more than a century, citing in a release shrinking enrollment as a factor. We're going to get an update on the situation in South Euclid coming up. But first, let's talk about this so-called enrollment cliff and what that means for not only institutions, but also families and prospective students. Joining me by phone is Eric Kelderman, senior writer with the Chronicle for Higher Education. Eric, welcome. Thanks. It's uh, great to be with you. Great to have you. And if you'd like to join the conversation or have a question for Eric, call 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Eric, let's talk a little bit more about what we mean by a demographic or enrollment cliff. Yeah, sure. So uh, as many of your listeners probably know, that the nation's demographics uh, have been changing uh, significantly in recent decades. Uh, the enrollment cliff refers specifically to uh, an overall decline in the birth rate that happened uh, during the Great Recession, so way back in 2008. Um, and what that means is that uh, in 2026, when a lot of the children who were born, say, uh, in 2008, uh, will be, you know, sort of traditional college age, uh, there will be a lot fewer of them than there are now. Uh, so we're, we're expected to see, after 2026, about a 15% uh, decline in the number of high school uh, graduates. And 15%, how big a number is that when you're talking about potential prospective students going into a college or university? Um. That's a great question. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it could be in the millions. Uh, I'm I'm a little fuzzy on the actual numbers. I think but... more to the point of my question is the impact. Fifteen percent doesn't sound like the end of the world, and yet the impact seems to be substantive when it comes right. to colleges and universities being able to anticipate. Hey, we're going to have this amount of students potentially enrolling each year. Sure. Well, the impact on colleges and universities is going to vary quite a bit by the kind of institution. So, for instance, uh, a small private institution like Notre Dame that uh, traditionally has relied on, say, white uh, middle and upper middle class students um, is going to be most impacted. We know that the the white birth rate in the country has been falling for decades. Um, And so that's really what's impacting Notre Dame right now. The enrollment cliff hasn't even hit yet. Uh, and we're we're already seeing a number of colleges struggling with enrollment, uh, in part because the the college going rate uh, has been declining since around 2011. So really, when you're talking about these smaller institutions, it's the expectation of of of, of prospective students, and they're almost all white. Is that is that correct? Uh, coming I mean, to these institutions, for for the most part, that's that's true. Uh, in in the the, the changes that we've seen in the dem- demographics of the country um, have hit New England and the upper Midwest most significantly, mm. uh, in part because the population there is, is uh, least diverse. Um, and so that's, that's really what's happening to a lot of these colleges. They're struggling to enroll the kinds of students that they have for most of their history, <clears throat> and they're unable to reach out uh, to, you know, national uh, you know, potentially students across the nation, right? And you're saying that the that really we haven't even hit the cliff. So, what have yeah. schools been doing? It, it, it it's kind of like when you know an asteroid's going to hit. I mean, what have right. these colleges and institutions been doing to brace for this, especially in light of the fact that they were already hit hard by the pandemic? It's it's tough for especially for the small institutions in particular, right? Because if they're small to begin with. They don't have big, say, 
marketing budgets, right, or big budgets to go out and recruit students in uh, high population states like California or Texas or Florida. Um, and it's tougher to recruit students from there because you're competing with all the other colleges that want to get those students. Um, so what we've seen is, you know, uh, in some cases, I guess, some institutions have been successful by, say, um, offering more online degrees, uh, offering graduate degrees, master's degrees, and say education for teachers or nursing, something like that that's in high demand. Uh, but a lot of them, frankly, have just been uh, slowly paring away at their academic offerings and um, hoping for the best, you know, hoping to, to hold on as long as they can. And uh, for colleges like Notre Dame, uh, you know, some of them simply aren't going to survive. I mean, uh, when you talk about the landscape of, of smaller colleges and universities, are we in crisis mode? Are, are a lot of them closing up? I mean, what does that look like nationwide? You know, that's a harder question to answer. Typically, every year we see, say, somewhere between a dozen and, I don't know, 20 small colleges close, right? Um, it, it is getting tougher, uh, and there's some other factors that are at play here uh, right now the uh, for, for those of your listeners who uh, have students who are going to college in the fall for the first time there they may have struggled with filling out the uh, the free application for federal student aid there's been a real delay in that uh, and that is impacting colleges as well they haven't been able to uh, put out their their financial aid package offers um, in a timely fashion, and that makes a lot of uncertainty for the fall enrollment. So some of these schools are going to be, some of these colleges are going to be deeply impacted by that in addition to everything else that's going on. Yeah, what happened there with that free application for federal student aid? Even <laughs> listening to NPR uh, on our airwaves, I've been hearing about how that really uh, uh, kind of botched the uh, application process for a lot of students. So what happened? Right. Well, we've only got a half an hour, as I understand it, so uh, I'll be brief. Make it short. (laughs) I'm just uh, kidding. (laughs) You know, so in uh, a couple of years ago, Congress passed uh, a law to change, to shorten the the FAFSA, as it's called, uh, which is great in a lot of ways. It's supposed to reduce the burden on students in terms of uh, being able to fill it out. Um, But the education department really wasn't able to meet the the deadline in terms of the the technical demands. A lot of these, you know, the lot of these government programs are legacy systems built on ancient uh, programming code, and that makes it very difficult. So, you know, it, instead of rolling out the FAFSA in October, uh, it really wasn't ready until sort of early spring. So everything's behind the curve about three months. I see. So let's go back to uh, the enrollment cliff and how colleges and universities, especially the smaller ones that might may be in regions like ours, how are they repositioning themselves to attract more students? And maybe if you say traditionally, you know, a bulk of them have been uh, white middle class uh, kids, you know, and, and, and people in 08 weren't having as many. I mean, are they going for more minority students, people out of the typical demographic? Are they changing the offerings? Uh, you mentioned nursing. Uh, that's huge in Ohio. Right. Um, but uh, what other kind of maneuverings are they doing to maybe make themselves appetizing to a prospective student? Uh, there's not a lot they can do. Some of them are emphasizing sort of their distinction, right? Uh, the small class sizes. Um, some of them are emphasizing maybe their faith-based uh, history, right, to, to appeal to students that are interested in that sort of thing. Um, and then maybe some of them are, are repositioning in terms of offering different kinds of programs that they think might be appealing. At the same time, many of them are, are have to cut other programs that are low enrolled. So we've seen a big cut in sort of liberal arts programs, languages, in, in particular foreign languages, have been on the chopping block at a lot of colleges, things like that. So let me ask you, how are the big schools doing? How is Cleveland State, the the OSU, how are the big universities doing when it comes to coming out of the pandemic and then uh, facing this enrollment cliff? 
Well, I, I've just seen that Cleveland State is actually facing some some budget constraints as well and some enrollment problems. So uh, they're not doing great. Uh, in general, what's happened is that the big flagship schools, the large publics, are doing the best. Um, a lot of students see them as affordable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, most students go to college within driving distance of their homes, uh, and if if you're in, you know, within 60 or 100 miles of Ohio State, the Ohio State, pardon me, uh, that might you might see that as a as an appealing option, especially if you see that a lot fewer students are applying to college, and you think, well, maybe my chances now are better to get into a more selective. Uh, institution and so we've seen instead of uh, instead of students going to more community colleges or less selective institutions or even more affordable public regionals like Cleveland State the, the applications of the larger and more selective schools are are growing okay so that that kind of inherently does allow for a dim different demographic maybe um, to, to go to a four-year college that has a little bit of, of status um, than previously had happened. You know, one of the things that we've talked about uh, in our newsroom uh, with with our producers is um, the notion of of students or young people not necessarily seeing the four year college as the I must go to that in order to have a long and flourishing career. Do you think there is some sort of cultural shift happening when it comes to the perspective of the four-year school and how that plays a role in into um, someone's success and how they might do in the workplace? Absolutely. I was just in my home state of Iowa a few weeks ago, and the message there that I got from uh, high school counselors and students and, and people on college campuses was that if students didn't see, uh, you know, a strong return on their, you know, investment, a job or something that was uh, very, very uh, certain after college that they might not go, that they might in choose to go into the workforce right away as sort of, and until they sort of figure out sort of their long-term life plans. Um, rising wages after the pandemic has probably made that a little more uh, appealing to a lot of students. Um, fears about being, you know, getting a degree with a lot of student debt and not having a job probably exacerbate uh, that situation as well. In our own polling, the Chronicle did some polling about a year ago, and we found that a lot of people think that, uh, you know, trade schools, apprenticeships, uh, mm. military service uh, are, uh, are, are equally uh, as good at preparing you for, uh, you know, your, your career options as is college. So, so there is definitely a, uh, a lot of thinking along that line. What does the data show? Uh, it's my understanding that data still kind of leads to the idea that if you go to a four-year school, um, you're likely to get a better job. It is helpful later in life. Uh, is that right? Overall, that is true. If you get a college degree, your your odds are uh, that you will you will earn more money over the career over the course of your lifetime. Uh, your your health outcomes are better. Your the quality of your life in general is is better. Now, there's a lot of caveats with that, right? Uh, if you get a degree in something that doesn't pan out for you and you have to pay off your student loans for 20 years or something like that, then that obviously impacts uh, you know, your long-term prospects as well. So, Eric, then what are you watching out for as a national higher ed reporter when it comes to um, how these universities and colleges are going to fare over the next several years? Yeah, I, I think we're, you know, I'm watching the number of closures, the number of colleges that are, um, you know, either merging uh, with other institutions. That's become one option for some of these institutions uh, to sort of, uh, you know, uh, combine their costs with another institution that might be in the area. Oftentimes this is a, a, a larger, more financially secure institution that is merging with a smaller, less financially secure institution and, and that's tough, though, for, for alumni, right? They see their college alma mater going away and all that tradition, and I think that's hard for a lot of alumni to accept. Sure. Um, but for, for many of them, uh, for many of these institutions, a, a merger or a partnership uh, will be an option. We know that this happened with um, uh, Otterbein, for instance, right? Uh, it recently uh, formed a partnership with um, 
part of what used to be uh, Antioch, right? Antioch University. That's right. So two Ohio institutions. Um, and I think that sort of, uh, that, that won't be a good fit for everyone, but I think a lot of colleges are, are looking at that as well. And um, I'm just curious as well, you, you talked about the, the demographics. Are we seeing um, a, a leveling when it comes to more minority students or even international students going to American universities and colleges? Right. Well, international students were big until about uh, 2016, and then there was a big drop-off after the Trump administration came into office. Um, that is that is not rebounded entirely, uh, in part because we used to rely a lot on American universities, big universities used to rely a lot on uh, uh, enrollment of Chinese students. That's that's changed, and, and probably for the long term. Uh, but other countries out there, like uh, India and students from Africa and South South America, uh, are still an option for some institutions. But you've got to have a kind of a big name, right, to attract students from from other countries. Um, yes, we will see probably a, a, a diversification of the college student population in coming years, in part because we're going to be a majority minority country by 2040 or so. Right. And so, uh, and so, if colleges don't uh, enroll more Hispanic and and Asian students in particular, because those are the fastest growing uh, groups in America, uh, then then we're going to see more closures. Eric Kelderman with the Chronicle for Higher Education. I appreciate you calling in and having this conversation with me. Happy to do it. Time now for a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about South Euclid. We're going to talk with the city leader from that city about what comes next for Notre Dame College. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. You're with The Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for staying with us this hour. If you're just joining us, we just discussed the enrollment or demographic cliff that's impacting colleges and universities nationwide and here in Northeast Ohio. Earlier this month, Notre Dame College in South Euclid closed its doors after more than a century in operation. Among the factors that were cited for making the decision were shrinking enrollment, a declining number of college-age students, and accrued debt. The college held its final commencement on May 4th. Joining me now by phone to talk about what comes next for Notre Dame College and its campus is Justin Tisdale. He's a council person at large for South Euclid City Council. Justin, welcome to the show. Jay, thank you for having me today. And if you'd like to join the conversation with a thought or a question, please do. Call 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. So is it okay if I call you Justin? Yes, it is. Let me ask you, what what kind of a blow was it when the news came out that Notre Dame was going to have to shutter its doors after a century of operation? Um, I think for for myself as an alum, um, it was a huge blow. I, I, I think that as an alum, we knew that the school may have be, been having financial issues. However, um, we did not know that it would lead to a closure of the school. Um, and as a community, to be a, in the, as a community leader and in the community, a lot of people were upset. Um, it's a beautiful campus. A lot of people in the community uh, love to go up there and walk and, and enjoy the college um, atmosphere with the students up there. Now, is there still a prospect that the college can stay open in any respect? Yes. So... Uh, there is there is a chance um, myself as well as Peter Corrigan and Lynn Barker, um, the baseball coach, we have filed an injunction um, to possibly to have the sale of the assets being the school delayed until we have an opportunity or the benefactors have an opportunity to speak with Bank of America regarding the current loan that is in default. Okay. Now that doesn't guarantee that doesn't guarantee that the school will be able to stay open. What it will do is give us give the school an opportunity, the benefactors an opportunity to attempt to pay down the loan to keep the school open. 
Let me ask you this, though. It, it sounds like that's uh, a, a, a kind of a temporary fix. But if, if, as the college is mentioning, it's about shrinking enrollment, it's about not making enough money and, and being in debt and, and anticipating um, a lower enrollment, how do you fix that in the long term to keep the doors open? Uh, in the long term, I mean, it's going, obviously, it's not, Notre Dame is not going to be the same Notre Dame that it was before with the amount of students that it is. However, there are examples, for example, there is Sweetbriar University or Sweetbriar College out in Virginia that was going through the similar um, situation we're going through, and yet they started small. Um, they continue to grow, um, and that's our hope is that Notre Dame can in some shape or form continue, we know that it's not going to have the same enrollment. Um, but if we can get the right people in there, the right board, the right president, um, we think and we believe that we can continue to grow the school to what it was. It's not going to be the same. There's going to be some bumps and bruises. Um, but we do believe that we have the financing and we have the people um, that are fighting for the school that can keep it open. And so where are we currently with this injunction, this lawsuit? Currently, it was filed. Um, As of right now, I believe the board president is um, is saying that she did not receive it. Um, We do have a lawyer. We have retained a lawyer. Um, And so we have filed it. It There is a a, a judge that is assigned to the case. Um, And so right now, it is just at its early beginnings of the, the process, the legal process. Now, we did reach out to the Board of Trustees regarding the lawsuit, and the board issued this statement, which I'm going to read. While we cannot Mm -hmm. discuss the details of the ongoing litigation, we firmly believe that the actions of our board have been driven by an unwavering commitment to the best interests of the students served. We witnessed this commitment at our recent final graduation ceremony a bittersweet moment for our entire school community. And we know that Notre Dame College's true legacy lies in the thousands of successful alumni who embody our values and mission around the world. As we move forward, we are actively working to ensure that the campus continues to be an asset to the South Euclid community. As we have updates that we can share regarding this process, we will make sure to do so. Now, Justin, the campus sits on 48 beautiful acres in South Euclid. Are you hearing from neighbors concerned about what happens with just the geography, the the campus itself? Let's say uh, the college cannot be saved. Uh, My understanding is it's already listed for sale. Correct. And so it is listed for sale. And I believe June 21st is the final day for bids to be accepted. And at that point, um, we hope at even as a city's view, that we will be um, incorporated in those decisions and to know what will be replacing, if anything, um, the campus. It's only zoned for residential and single-family homes. I mean, I'm sorry, it's only zoned for education and single-family homes. So at this point, we are hoping that if for some reason the lawsuit does not work, um, that a college will replace that area. Um, if not, I, I, I don't that's a lot. That's 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 a lot to incorporate single family homes into that area. So you really want it to be kept um, somewhat in the spirit of 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 a higher ed institution or a place of learning. Let me ask you, uh, Justin, as an alum of Notre Dame College, um, can you share a memory or 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 or, or, or an experience with the college that gives you great pride? Um, Notre Dame College, for me, is more than just a place where you learn. For me, Notre Dame College is its a family. It's a community. I, I know everybody when I was there, from the president all the way down to the custodial crew. Um, so for me, it was a family atmosphere. The friends that I have now, the, the text message threads that are 20 years, 20, 25 years old because of the friends and the relationships that were built at Notre Dame College. Um, Notre Dame College is a place to where a group of people from all walks of life, from all neighborhoods got together, from all places all over the world, got together. We functioned, we lived, we played, we learned, and we grew bonds and, and, and relationships that lasted forever. So I, and there's no specific memory that I can, I can pinpoint, but I know for me it is just the experience that I had those three years on that campus with the students, the professors, the staff, 
everybody. Well, you summed it up perfectly, Justin. Uh, we will be watching and, 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 and are curious to see what ultimately happens with the college and, of course, the campus. My thanks to South Euclid City Council person at large, Justin Tisdale. Thank you so much for talking to me. No problem. Thank you for having me and have a blessed day. You too. Idea Stream Education reporter Connor Morris will continue to follow this story so you can find his coverage on this at ideastream.org. We will take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk to Vinton Cerf, dubbed one of the fathers of the internet. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. It's The Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks for spending the hour with us. Can you imagine a time before the internet? Many of us cannot, and for those of us who can, and remember that, it feels a world away. The internet has completely shaped how we communicate, how we learn and obtain information, and even how we experience the world around us. Vinton Cerf is considered one of the fathers of the internet, thanks to his work from the 60s to the 80s, where he was part of developing the architecture of the internet. His career as a technology innovator led him to Google, where since 2005, he served as chief internet evangelist. Today, SURF will address Case Western Reserve University graduates as the 2024 Convocation Commencement Speaker. Dr. Vinton SURF joins me in studio today to talk about, about his work and his speech later today at Case. Welcome to you. Well, thanks so much, Jenny. It's a real pleasure to be on the show. And, and thanks for making time on, on such a busy day. If you'd like to join the conversation or have a, co- a question, call 866 866- Five seven eight zero nine zero three, and you can email us at soi at ideastream dot org, or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. No, I'm sure you've heard this a million times before, but what a hefty and lofty title! One of the fathers of the internet. I'd love to hear about the work. So, it was during the sixties, seventies, and early eighties, as you've told me. And you were working in conjunction with the Department of Defense? That's correct. So what was the problem posed to you um, to come up with a solution for? Well, let me give you a little bit of background. There was a predecessor project that was called ARPANET. That ARPA part was the Advanced Research Projects Agency. Today it's called the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, They were supporting funding research in artificial intelligence in the 1960s. I know it's a hot topic today here in the 2020s, but that work has been going on for over 60 years. They had, I don't know, like a dozen universities that were doing the work. And every one of those research departments, computer science departments, kept saying, you have to buy us a new world-class computer every year to keep going with world-class research. And even the Defense Department said, we can't do that, but we're going to build a network and you're going to share your computing resources and your software. And they said, listen, we're going to fund all of you. We're going to build the network. Please share everything because uh, we don't want you competing with each other. We want you cooperating with each other to advance the work. So uh, ARPA pursued a packet-switched network, which is quite different from the way the telephone system works. That's called circuit switching. ARPANET got built in the 1969-70 or so. I was a graduate student at UCLA participating in that, not leading the effort by any means. Um, But I participated in the development of the software that was used to make the uh, ARPANET and the host computers on it work. Then uh, I left after finishing a PhD and went up to Stanford in late 72 to join the uh, faculty there. And my colleague, Robert Kahn, Uh, who had worked on the ARPANET project for a company called Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, went to ARPA. Hmm. And in the spring of 73, he came out to Stanford, and he said, we have a problem. And I said, what do you mean we? And he said, look, we're now coming to the conclusion that computers could be used in military command and control. If you could manage your resources better than the other guy, you might be able to win even if you had a smaller force than the other one did. That's called a force multiplier. So the question was how to do that, because if you're going to be using these things for field operations, you need to have mobile communication. You need ships at sea talking to each other, so you need satellites for long-distance communication. And the ARPANET had been built on dedicated telephone circuits connecting the little packet switches to each other. Hmm. So that was the problem. How do we get these three different kinds of networks, the packet radio net, packet satellite net, and the ARPANET, 
to interwork in a transparent and uniform way. That was the internet problem. And within about six months, we figured out how to do that. We wrote a paper, which was published literally 50 years ago by IEEE Transactions on Communications on May 6th, 1974. Wow. And I started working uh, with Bob uh, and my graduate students at, uh, at Stanford to do the actual detailed specification implementation. And, of course, we had lots and lots of help, and ARPA supported that work. Sure. So at its very core, it was always just a communications network. And in the very beginning, it was so that you – campus academics could share your research and your work and actually be coordinating as opposed to working in a silo and having no idea what the guys, you know, up the coast or down the coast were doing. Yes. And the first application that came up uh, of significance on the ARPANET, the predecessor to the internet, was remote access to other people's computers Mm -hmm. and electronic mail, as well as file transfers back and forth. Electronic mail started in 1971. So I've been using that medium for many, many years now. And almost instantly, we discovered that it was a social medium. We created distribution lists. The first one I joined was sci-fi lovers. We argued over who were the best science fiction writers. Nice. And the next one who I joined... Who were some of the top names? Yeah, uh, well, uh, let, gee, you know, you know, oh, let... Oh, I put you, know, you on the spot. Put me we'll on come the spot. back to you that. Know, <laughs> uh, God, Heinlein, for example. How about Asimov? Asimov, for yep. example. <laughs> Hal Clement. Uh, lots of others. Uh, oh, the second one uh, list that I joined was called Yum Yum. It was a restaurant review for the Palo Alto area where Stanford sits. I hear you're a foodie. I I'm, read that. I'm a foodie. Mm. I am a foodie. I'm a whiny, too. I whine a lot. <laughs> so the important thing uh, for this part of our conversation is that we could see some of the social effects of having these kinds of computer communications capability. In the case of the Internet, Um, we knew that if it was going to be used for command and control, we would need to support voice, video, and data. We knew we needed real-time communication to track radar tracking, for example. You want to know where the missile is, not where it was. Sure. So we actually were experimenting with packetized voice and packetized video in the late 70s and early 80s. What we we do today, video conferencing, Zoom, Google Meet, all those things, we were doing that in small quantities. 50 years ago. Wow. And so in 1982, as you were telling me, there was actually kind of a literal switching of something that kind of turned the internet on. That was a flag day. Um, We had these three networks, packet radio, packet satellite, and the ARPANET. I was running the program at the time uh, for the Defense Department uh, at ARPA. And at the beginning of 1982, we told everyone that they had to be running the new TCP IP protocols that made the internet work right. by January 1, 1983, or you're off the net. And so people grumbled, but uh, they recognized that I had the ability to force that. So I had somebody at uh, USC Information Sciences Institute tracking how many people had actually got their TCPs running. Mm-hmm. And about June or so, the curve flattened out. So I called the Defense Communications Agency that was running ARPANET, and I said, shut off the ability to carry the old protocols, only carry the new ones for a day. Of course, my phone rings off the hook, you idiot, what do you think you're doing? They said, I just want you to know I can do that. Then the curve starts going up again, and then in October it flattened out, and I said, shut it off for two days. Almost everybody made it on January 1. A few didn't, we gave them some time, and they all got up eventually. So let's fast forward to now. In your wildest dreams, could you imagine that the Internet is as ubiquitous, as, as so involved in our daily lives in, in every which way and as expansive as it is now? Well, we had hopes for things like that. I won't say that we imagined everything, but uh, I kept promoting uh, Internet. And by the uh, late 1980s, I started wondering whether we would ever get anyone on the network other than those supported by research agencies like the Department of Energy or NASA or the National Science Foundation or ARPA for that matter. So I started promoting the idea that we should get the general public up and make it, make it available to the, the private sector. Sure. And uh, it, that required legislation because it turns out that there was an appropriate use policy that said the only people that could use it were people supported by government research agencies. 
So that legislation was was promoted by Senator then Senator Al Gore and later Vice President Al Gore. So he deserves credit for helping us get that legislation passed. The first commercial internet services started in 1989. Mm-hmm. And think about what comes next. Tim Berners-Lee at CERN releases the World Wide Web in December 91. Hardly anybody noticed except two guys at the National Center for Supercomputer Applications, Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina, Mm -hmm. who take one look at this World Wide Web idea, which, by the way, was intended by uh, by, uh, Tim Berners-Lee to allow a scientist to share their results. Again, we're back to sharing again to accelerate the rate of research. So these guys at NCSA build the Mosaic browser, which is a graphical user interface, takes the world by storm. The internet suddenly looks like it's a a magazine with formatted text and everything else. Netscape Communications gets started. It goes public in 1995. The stock goes through the roof. The dot boom is on. So I lived through 50 years of this, and teaspoon by teaspoon, it became increasingly obvious this was going to be a big deal. So my understanding, I I, I was reading uh, profiles on you, and uh, you've had... uh, uh uh, uh, hearing issue. That's right. Since you were a young child. That's correct. And and having that uh, has really informed how you kind of approach your work, um, and it has made accessibility um, really on the fore of how you see technology and the work that you do. That's absolutely correct. Uh, I've been wearing hearing aids since I was 13. By the way, 13 is a hell of an age to start wearing hearing aids. Sure. Well, I mean, the problem is you start to discover girls, and then you discover your hearing aids squeak when you're making out. It's really awkward. <laughs> you know, you, you take them off, and then you can't talk, or you leave them on, and, it's can't hear and it ruins the mood and everything else. Oh, I've gotten past aids. that. But anyway, uh, I am a great, great proponent of accessibility and using computer technology, for example, to enhance accessibility. I was a, a big proponent of the captioning, closed captions for television, for example. Um, and I really am excited about ways of using computer technology to make things more accessible. Uh, we have things at Google that are, are really amazing. We have real-time uh, captioning, for example. We have an application on a mobile called Livestream. Basically, it takes sound in and produces captions. So wow. if you're in a place where you're, not, you're trying to have a conversation you and you can't hear the other person, we've got the ability to show uh, those captions for you right there on the spot. So is that the kind of technology that you get to celebrate with your role at Google now? Yes, I am uh, one of the executive sponsors for several employee resource groups. So one of them is called the Deflers. Those are people that either sign or uh, are hearing impaired. But there's the Greglers. Those are the folks with a little bit of gray hair. And uh, and uh, <laughs> oh, the Disability Alliance is a broad collection of people who deal with disabilities of all kinds, whether it's personal or maybe it's a family member. So I'm promoting everything I, in every way I can, the use of the technologies that we work with to assist people with those kinds of challenges. Uh, I, I'm curious. I mean, it, it seems really like a neat concept that, that Google realized your role in the innovation of, you know, kind of the basis of what they do um, and asked you to come on and continue celebrating kind of the next frontier. I'm curious, uh, you know, as kind of a legacy maker for the internet and, and computer science broadly, what kind of messaging do you have for the kids today you know, when you're speaking with the graduates at Case Western? Well, the first thing to observe is from the internet point of view, it is a highly flexible architecture. It is still evolving. There are still opportunities to invent new protocols, to invent new transmission technology, and to make it a better place. We have a lot of work, speaking of better places, to do to make it a safer place. It has become a place where there are toxic environments that people encounter. We have work to do from the legislative point of view and from the enforcement point of view to hold parties accountable who are doing harmful things on the net. That's very disappointing, but it's human nature, unfortunately. Once the Internet became broadly available, we had to know that it would it would uh, enhance some people's ability to do harmful things. So we have to work on that. I mean, it's it's polarizing. It it can it's an amplifier, and it can be yeah. very polarizing. Yes. And we do see that uh, with you know political groups and and just how it kind of amplifies a perspective one might have and and continues that on. I mean, I don't know how you 
how you fight against well, that. But well, look, this is not a new problem. All yeah. broadcast media have the potential. The big difference between television and radio and newspapers is that usually there were only a small number of publishers, of broadcasters. But on the internet, everybody is a broadcaster. Everybody is a publisher, thanks to these platforms, especially the social media ones. Okay, we have a caller on the line. We don't have much time, but I'm going to take her call. Elizabeth in Cleveland Heights, go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Just a quick question about the um, use currently of building the internet via blockchain technology and the potential implications of that in terms of uh, data ownership of individuals and job opportunities uh, for people learning to code in Solidity and additional programming languages. Thanks, Elizabeth, for your question. Hi, Elizabeth. It's Vint. Uh, first of all, blockchain run the other way. I'm, I'm not a big fan. Technically, technically, it's a useful technology at certain scales, but I would watch out for Bitcoin and other kinds of cryptocurrencies. I don't think there's a lot of substance there. Uh, with regard to software, wow, the world is wide open. Uh, that, that's an endless resource. It's only limited by your ability to imagine and code. And so I've been a huge fan of people learning the, the disciplines of, of programming. Even if you're not going to be a programmer, good to learn how to program because it makes you think logically. You have to dis disarticulate problems, solve the pieces, and put them all back together. That's a skill that works for a whole lot of different disciplines. So I would urge everyone to get a little programming under their belt. So, Vincent, can you tell me about your thoughts about what the big next innovation in computer science is? I mean, everyone's got their eyes on AI. Is it is it going to transform everything? Well, AI is turning out to be a very powerful but quirky uh, capability. We have a lot of work to do to make it reliable. Uh, computational X for every value of X you can think of is becoming the norm. We're using computers to do things that we couldn't do before. Dry chemistry, for example, astrophysics. Um, the next big thing for Internet is the interplanetary extension of the Internet. I was just at the White House. In fact, last week we had a week-long discussion about building an interplanetary backbone network to support manned and robotic space exploration and the commercialization of space. We're well along in that project because we started in 1998 at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Now NASA, ESA, JAXA, and CARI, all these space agencies, are involved in, in developing the technology which will be deployed as we return to the moon and go on to Mars. Dr. Vinton Cerf, one of the fathers of the Internet, who will be speaking today to Case Western Reserve University graduates as the 2024 Convocation Commencement Speaker. Those students are lucky to be hearing from you, and I am uh, very grateful that you came into the studio to speak with me. Thanks so much, Jenny. I enjoyed it. It is graduation season, and commencement speakers are serving up wit and wisdom when advising new graduates. As we do each year, we turn to all of you on social media for a line or nugget of advice for the class of 2024. Executive editor Mike McIntyre stitched all that advice together. Here now is our crowdsourced commencement speech for this year's graduates. To the class of 2024, everyone is looking for the keys to success. Here they are. Show up and take responsibility. The key to success is to do what you say you will do. Hard work is not a bad thing. Work hard and build your network. These two things will set you up for a successful career. Remain humble, aware, compassionate, and curious. Always remember that compassion trumps indifference in life. Listen to the voice that's telling you to create something always buy the concert tickets. The world needs your hope and your passion. Chase your dreams because they won't chase you. Walk in doubt, step with confidence. Stay true to yourself and be authentic. The world has enough people trying to be someone they're not. Confidence comes from competence. Develop a severe allergy to generalizations about generations, your own and others. Notice when things are nice. And when you feel like complaining about how bad the old folks messed everything up, remember, they just got here too. Don't burn the boomers. Try to think for yourself before using AI. When faced with two choices, pick the one that scares you the most. 
No matter what advice you receive, to succeed, to triumph, to prosper, to thrive, remember to be kind. Just be nice. The only person you're guaranteed to spend the rest of your life with is yourself. Treat yourself with love and kindness. Buy yourself flowers. There is no greater joy than loving someone even more than you love yourself. Find your own happiness in yourself. Invest in yourself. Learn to know your limits and worth. Become your own best friend. You're entering a phase of life where all too often it's all about you. Make sure to focus on others, not just yourself. Do something for someone you will never meet. Say yes to as many things as you can, except drugs. Try to accomplish something each day. The first thing is making your bed when you get up. The little accomplishments add up to big accomplishments. Expect nothing. Earn everything. Don't think of mistakes as failures. You can always pivot. Fall apart on schedule. Since you, just like everyone else in the world, will never be perfect, know that every failure is an opportunity to grow. Stay strong and keep the faith. If it's not going to matter in five years, don't stress about it. Life's like a Wi-Fi signal. Sometimes you just need to reset to find a better connection. Be a positive person and try to hang out with positive people. Not only do they get things done, they're way more fun. If you're going to marry someone, which I highly recommend, it's great, make sure you find someone with good taste in TV shows, because that's the only thing you'll do together, especially if you have kids. Ditch your smartphone for at least an hour a day. This especially applies to the bathroom. In school, your success is often measured by how well you follow the instructions. At work, there are almost never instructions. It's okay to say, I don't know. If you throw your mortarboard into the air and don't catch it, you have to go to grad school so you can try again. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Give some of your money away. You'll be richer for it. You're never too young to start to build your financial future. Time is the most valuable resource you have. Be mindful of how and with whom you spend it, in work and in life. Remember to call your mom. Dream big, act boldly, and never underestimate your potential. The world belongs to you, and the only limits that exist are the ones you set for yourself. Keep aiming high, do things, go places, and when the time is right, drink beer. Easy on the cheese. Sure, it's tasty and all, but your gut really doesn't need all that. I have two words for you. Listen very closely. Greek yogurt. The future is a foreign country. Learn the mindset of an immigrant. Don't rake your leaves. Nature prefers it that way. Even if you get rich and live in Bratnall and every lawn on the street looks like a golf course, don't rake them. If you want to steal deep thoughts from famous people, pick Vonnegut. If you've always wanted to try something, go for it. Nobody cares. You're a grown-up now. Don't be a dum-dum. That was executive editor Mike McIntyre with the crowdsource commencement speech. And Mike, you'll be happy to know that Dr. Vinton Cerf, father of the Internet, found that highly amusing and maybe perhaps a little inspiring. Greek yogurt. Right on target. (laughs) There we go. Inspiration for his speech later today. Now, to get the last word on today's topic, send an email to soi at ideastream.org. We're on Twitter, now X at Sound of Ideas. You can follow me at Jenny Hamill underscore or on Instagram at Jenny Hamill Idea Stream. Yesterday, we had a really great discussion regarding how sports facilities are paid for and had a ton of interaction. Betsy Center thoughts. I believe all pro facilities should be owned by the team if needed funds with IDRBs paid back by the team, but no public money, just like any other business. And Bill sent in this feedback in regards to a potential dome stadium in Brook Park. I live near Ford Field, the dome stadium in downtown Detroit. It's used constantly for things like concerts, motocross events, large educational commencements, and numerous other community organizations and events. The stadium is at least used 50 or more times a year. We'd like to thank you all for the feedback. Tomorrow on The Sound of Ideas, we're going to talk about school funding in Ohio and the fatigue some voters feel surrounding property tax levy requests. If you missed any portion of the program today, find us online. You can listen to The Sound of Ideas podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You can also hear a rebroadcast tonight at 9 on 89.7 WKSU. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll speak with you again tomorrow.